Hey everyone, perpetually delayed guy here, and I'm sweating in my suit because it's 80 degrees in my house right now, and it's really hot outside. Uh, so I was asked uh, if I had any thoughts on the Smarter Everyday video that talked about the Artemis program from like seven months ago. I said I'd get it done in January. Happy July, everyone. Also, I should note, uh, my leg pain is a shin splint. I guess I ran on the treadmill wrong, and it still hurts because I kept making it worse because I'm dumb. So, you know, make of that what you will. All right, so I, I actually typed up my notes this time. Isn't that good? So I can read them. Okay, so, so overall here on the Smarter Everyday video, which you should watch, by the way, uh, I do agree with Destin, that's his name, right? Destin's message. NASA and Associated Company have been far less communicative than they have been before. I'll put it this way. When I do research for end of mission, there's uh, press kits for those shuttle missions I do. And they tell you everything. They tell you all the experiments that are aboard. They even tell you where they are. They tell you a little bit about them. I have to do some research on what the results are or some more you know, detail on them, but you can find all this data. And for the Apollo missions, the press kits are like 170 pages long, and they do tell you everything. They tell you the favorite color of the guy who built the bolts. Blue, by the way. So, yeah, it has been, NASA and company have been far less open about everything than they have been in the past. Now, in the case of something like commercial crew, it's because it's up to the private launch provider's uh, prerogative to tell you how much they they, for them to, to tell how much NASA wants them people to tell. They get to determine how much you get to know. This is why the Starliner issues, we know so much more about them than anything that's ever happened with uh, Crew Dragon, which Crew Dragon has had basically the same issues with helium leaks and thruster failures. It's just SpaceX doesn't let anyone know about it because they're very secretive like that. I understand why, considering how much you know, the reporting on Starliner. Uh, yeah, and also I've heard that NASA's PR department has basically been gutted since 2010, and, well, 2010 was 14 years ago, because I'm old now, and, well, the world's changed since the shuttle program. A lot more internet things, a lot more sources, people don't really watch TV as much anymore, they watch, you know, Netflix and all those different streaming things, so I, it's possible that NASA is also just struggling to adapt to the modern world. I mean, it is a government agency, so they, they take their time with things. So there's probably a few other reasons why there's just poor communication on these things. I do think NASA should be more open about how the Artemis program is going to work and the different orbits. Now, it could be the fact that I just don't go looking for these things, but there has been a dearth of information you can find on these programs. So I don't blame Destin's uh, concerns because even I have a hard time finding things. But the big note I want to make here is that I think Destin's assessment of Artemis is incorrect. The simple answer for a program like Artemis is actually quite complicated compared to Apollo. Apollo is a very Cold War space race program. It's mostly meant, unfortunately, to just be the, you know, the better technological development than what the Soviets were doing, right? See, we can land people on the moon and bring them back. Look, they even bring back some, some rocks. Isn't that cool? So the Apollo program is mostly meant for that and actually kind of limited for a long-term, more sustainable program. I mean, if you look at some of the post-Apollo studies, the, the most charitable ones to keeping the Apollo spacecraft around had two Saturn V launches per every moon mission. One would launch an extended lunar module onto the surface, and then there'd be a normal Saturn V with normal lunar modules so the crew could stay on the moon for like a week or more. Not a very sustainable program. And then if you talk about things like the integrated program plan, which, you know, the space shuttle was the only thing that survived of that, they pretty much scrap the whole Apollo capsule idea and use the space shuttle to get crew and logistics up into low Earth orbit. Then we did keep the Saturn V to launch space station modules, nuclear tugs, and you know, certain other spacecraft. It was a far different program. The Apollo program, unfortunately, wasn't very sustainable. That's unfortunate, but hey, what can I say? Obviously, this is, I'm being very crude and with my rough assessment here, I'm just, you know, this is, I, I typed up a page of notes, not a full book. Uh, also, if you look at some of the historical reassessments of Apollo's safety, <laughs> uh, 
Not very good numbers, folks, for loss of crew probability. Not good at all. So you got to look at Artemis more as a shuttle international space station successor. That's why I have all these international partners. That's why SLS uses the shuttle budget and shuttle-derived hardware. It's more of that. It's a program that builds pretty much an ISS sort of around the moon. And as such, a much more sustainable architecture for long-term lunar presence, it's going to be far more complicated than Apollo. You also have to remember the political realities of today versus the Cold War. There's no Soviet Union anymore. Unless you're, you know, a weird person on the internet, Soviet Union doesn't exist, so that kind of ideological arms race is not as present. The budgets aren't really there. The, the fervor to go back isn't there. Unfortunate, again, I'm a space advocate. It is unfortunate we don't have that same fervor. So a 2020s program to go back to the moon is not gonna be Apollo. That's okay. Uh, so the big complaint that uh, Smarter Every Day brought up was a uh, near rectilinear halo orbit. Now he does complain about the chart that's presented. I found another one here. It's this guy. Uh, yeah, charts can be made to mis be misleading. That's that's a big secret of making charts. Go look at uh, if you look at launch vehicle design studies and see some of those. Uh, I'm you know incorrect assessments on certain concepts, but we'll we'll dance over that. Uh, but this idea of using NRHO for staging. Uh, lunar missions for long-term sustainable presence, you actually do end up with NRHO. The, the, someone brought up that there's some from the early 2000s. I found one from 2006. Look, you can see NRHO I'm right here, I hope. So uh, that's, that's how that's going. So NRHO is better suited for a long-term sustainable program. I'll go over some of these things. So Apollo used low lunar orbit. That made sense for the Apollo program, not long-term sustainable programs. So, the big complaint brought up would be, you know, communication spacecraft. And yeah, no matter what we're doing at the moon, we will need communications relays. Low lunar orbit, we need a, f uh, a lot more, because uh, it's, you know, it's really close to the surface. So, uh, there was an original study for an L2 re relay at uh, Earth Moon L2. Uh, now there is one there, the Chinese built one. But yeah, uh, low lunar orbit, not the best for communications. Uh, and there is limited surface accessibility because of the limited communications. Uh, right, the Apollo missions were on the side that faced the Earth. So it's easy, you have line of sight. Look, there's Earth, we can talk to it. Uh, let's see, there's a th thermal problem. The moon is actually quite hot. That's why people have romantic evenings looking at it, which poses a massive thermal problem when you're, you know, 100 miles above the surface. It's going to dump heat onto your spacecraft, which means you need better thermal management systems, which those weigh things, which means any lunar orbit space station will need a lot more thermal management and be heavier, which limits its capabilities. Plus, low lunar orbits are mostly unstable, so you'd have to use a lot of propellant to maintain these orbits, which is not good. So there's a lot of mass constraints to low lunar orbit that even a super heavy lift launch vehicle not exactly the best thing for that. Uh, they're also unstable, as I said, because the moon is lumpy. So there's a few frozen orbits, but those aren't the best for total lunar surface access, which NRHO sort of offers. Uh, it also offers a lot of accessibility to ballistic transfers. So if you watch the Hyten Hagaromo end of mission, uh, we talked about those. Low, low energy transfers into the, into the moon system or pretty much anywhere in the solar system if you really want to go there. Uh, so NRHO allows you to go in a lot, a lot easier accessibility. Also has easier accessibility to deep space. Now, someone once said that you pretty much sneeze the right way, you'd end up in an interplanetary trajectory. So that's great, especially if you want to do a long-term program to Mars. NRHO is the place to be. Uh, the lower performance requirements also makes it easier to reach, which means our international partners have you know, easier access to NRHO so they can build more things for us. Uh, it gives you better communication with the South Pole because the NRHO that's chosen for uh, Artemis spends about seven days over the South Pole. A lot of communications there, uh, which also makes it easier on power requirements because again, you're spending a lot of time not in the moon's shadow. Uh, the, the paper I'm using here actually talks about how much time 
gateway would actually be in darkness, like Earth's shadow and the moon's shadow. He's, no, it's just Earth's shadow. It's not that much. So that's great for power requirements, which makes it, you know, a lot easier to design. So Smarter Every Day does bring up one valid issue with NRHO that Low Lunar Orbit has an issue with, and that is abort modes. Now, unfortunately, since the lunar lander right now is privately developed, we don't actually know what the abort modes are or the performance capabilities needed for said abort modes. But considering how far into the program Lunar Starship is, I'm assuming and hoping it's, they should, they'll be working on this, that SpaceX and NASA are working on abort modes and designing them, you know, doing a FMEA analysis. So that is being done. Obviously, a more complicated architecture like this will have different abort modes than something like the Apollo program. So you got to remember, as a kind of a note on something like this, there's about a hundred different ways to go to the moon with people. But for a program like Artemis, with all of its technical requirements, the technical limitations, the budget limitations, then you got the political limitations too, you're going to end up with something that's, you know, there's maybe one or two possible solutions that actually work for what you want. Some of those are, are better suited for politics, some of them are better suited for technical reasons. But you got to pick one that works the best to satiate all of those. Artemis does that. It also means it's harder to kill. So, there we go. Now, of course, let's talk about where I absolutely agree with him. What do you think I agree on? Lunar Starship. We absolutely agree on this. And don't worry, I will talk about IFT4. That's the next thing I'm recording tonight as I melt. And yes, the big one here, the big reveal, it's been confirmed so many times. It is 15 launches, okay? Not four, not eight, not 10-ish, 15. There's been so much misinformation about this one aspect of the mission architecture that's just really annoying because our greatest source on it is the government. The actual space program has told us this number. NASA knows what the number is, okay? It's from the GAO report. We've known about this since the HLS decision, pretty much. There's been a lot of people trying to spread misinformation about this number, okay? The first one, of course, is Elon himself because, well, he's doing damage control. 15 is not a very good number for tanker flights. We're actually talking about 17 launches, right? Depot, 15 tankers, and then the lander system. So, 15 launches. Uh, now, there's other group. Now, SpaceX has said 10 ish in press conferences. Now, the reason they're not saying the actual number is not because they don't know. They know the number. It's 15. And let me tell you this it's embarrassing. It's actually an embarrassing number. That's why they'll never say it until they absolutely have to. Like when they tell NASA. They have to tell NASA this. Now, there's a whole bunch of amateur engineers and LARPers who kept doing weird delta-v calculations and really idealistic assumptions about Starship's performance to get less than 15. They're wrong, okay? Because you wanna know why? They don't have actual access to the performance figures of Starship, the delta-v requirements for this mission architecture, the boil-off rates, which I don't know, SpaceX doesn't know them yet either, but, right? They're wrong. Okay, the people who insist that it's, you know, eight or less are wrong. Uh, now, the number might change from 15 uh, once SpaceX actually starts doing propellant transfer tests. And once they get Starship actually flying and operational, they'll have a better uh, grasp on how bad boil-off is for them and how well the propellant transfer system works. But we're talking maybe one or two extra flights or less. One or two, plus or minus, on this. It's not going to be a, you know, reduction in half. Which, oh, that just reminds me, my, my favorite one that came out of this is, well, SpaceX had to give NASA a number, so they inflated it. Uh, that's called lying. You're not going to lie to the United States government when you're asking for $3 billion, okay? Do not lie to the United States government about those things. Uh, that's, that's called crime. Don't do that. Uh, so, yes, yeah, this number might actually change as Starship becomes operational and once SpaceX get a, gets a better grip on how well it actually performs, but it's not going to it's not going to be a significant change. Okay, so Smarter is absolutely right that this is a very complex and very risky architecture. Launching a fully reusable super heavy lift launch vehicle 17 times in a row over the course of what? 
like six months. I can't remember, uh, I can't remember the specifics of the transfer, uh, not the transfer times, the launch cadence, but that's a very complex uh, architecture and well, Starship's not there yet. So, and even then it's still very complex because you have to, and some of you will say, well, but you're doing the same thing multiple times. Yes, but the same thing is a very, is complicated. So launching a super heavy lift launch vehicle to a depot and performing cryogenic propellant transfer between one vehicle to the next while, while maintaining you know, certain margins of how much propellant actually makes it in, and boil off rates, I mean, orbital accuracy, that sort of thing, that's actually quite complicated. Space flight is complicated. Shockingly, it's a complex thing to do. Uh, now, the one thing I will push back on is the use of cryogenic propellants for these architectures. It's not inherently bad, and it's not inherently better to use storables, but for larger vehicles for longer duration stays, you're probably gonna end up with more cryogenic systems than storables. At, some, at that point, cryogenics actually do perform better than a storable system, despite the limitations of cryogenics. Now, this is still very immature technology. Uh, well, I know, was it the, the last lander, was it Nova C, did use LOX methane for its landing. So, subscale, very small compared to a lot of things, but it is still growing. It's not brand spanking new, it's not old, but it's not new. It still needs to be demonstrated, it's still a technology development program, but hey, Apollo was a massive technology development program. You can read about the things that Apollo had to do with the limitations they had in the past. So, you are gonna end up using some form of cryo, uh, cryogenic propellant transfer for any of these architectures. It would be cool too once they, get, once they actually get these working. Uh, now I want to emphasize, propellant transfer of what's being described for Artemis, either Starship or Blue Moon, has never been done before. I know some people like to bring up like the Salyuts and I mean the shuttle did a, a propellant transfer test with Freon and then there was the Orbital Express mission, but those were storables and you know not, you know, a hundred tons of propellant. It was, you know, like a hundred pounds at most. So it's, it is, it's risky, don't get me wrong, but for a sustainable long-term program like Artemis, that's probably the way to go. Yeah, so, so that's, that's it. Uh, sorry for taking so long to actually get to this. I know other people uh, in my, I guess, I won't call it my sphere, but other people have brought this video up before I did and varying degrees of success. Uh, I don't really have much to say. Overall, I do agree with Smarter Every Day. Um, yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate part about this. It's a challenge to discuss, uh, especially when someone's promising you things like Mars colonization. You know, going to the moon sounds pretty boring and this little, you know, little gateway station is probably not as exciting, but this is a real program with real things. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's it. See ya.